Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are in the world today, and Happy New Year. Welcome to the first installment of our PFF Disease Education Webinar Series of 2023. Um, I am excited to be here and sharing the topic of diagnosing ILD or interstitial lung disease with all of you today. We'll be talking about elements of a comprehensive evaluation. Um, I am Amy Hajari Case. I am a pulmonologist and ILD specialist in Atlanta. I am also a senior medical advisor for education and awareness at the foundation. Um, I am, uh, these are my disclosures for the day. None of them are relevant to our topic. And I'm actually joined today by Dr. Stephen Hobbs. Um, he is an associate professor of radiology and uh, medicine. He is, I'm sorry, let me get my notes up here. Oops, go back. Um, he is the chief of the Division of the Cardiovascular and Thoracic Radiology at the University of Kentucky. He is in, uh, uh, has spoken and educated nationally and internationally, um, and we are so glad to have him here today to talk specifically about imaging in the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis with um, particular focus on high resolution um, CT imaging. So thank you so much for being here. Um, we're gonna get started after just a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, as always, if you haven't attended our webinars before, this is intended to be informational and educational and we are not able to uh, give specific professional medical advice here. We will have time for questions at the end of our session today, um, but we won't be able to answer specific medical questions about your, um, your individual care. Um, and if you have, um, if you have your uh, control panel for, go for GoToWebinar to the right side of your screen or left, I guess it could be, um, if you'll look there, there is a tab for questions. If you do have questions during the session uh, throughout, please uh, go there and enter them. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, we've left some time at the end of our, end of our talk today. Um, we also have a chat uh, bar there where if you are having any technical issues or anything like that, you may um, open up that chat function and type us a message. We will try to adjust or address anything we're having trouble with. Um, and then also, if you are interested in downloading our slides for today's talk, they are under the handouts tab. You'll just drop that down and you can download those in a PDF form uh, while we're on our call, uh, on our, our talk today. And of note, this is being recorded and will be posted uh, to our website and our YouTube channel at a later date. So I'll get us started talking about the importance of a comprehensive evaluation for interstitial lung disease. Um, you know, we talk a lot about this um, delays in diagnosis. Um, interstitial lung diseases, pulmonary fibrosis, have very nonspecific symptoms. I will talk about that in just a minute, but they can present in ways that are much like other disease processes that are way more common than ILD and PF. And so um, when doctors are taught, they're taught to, um, if you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras, right? The things that are common are probably what's around, um, and the things that are left less common go lower down on our, our list of possibilities when we encounter a new problem in it or symptom in a patient. So that can create delays in diagnosis and also misdiagnosis when we get it wrong because these things are nonspecific and can present a little bit of a confusing way. But it's important to make a, uh, an accurate diagnosis in a timely fashion because that accurate diagnosis leads us to offer better treatment for the disease process. And so the job initially is to decide, is this interstitial lung disease? And if so, which one is it? Because there's a long list of possibilities. So we'll talk from the beginning. When a patient with um, interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis starts to experience symptoms or has the first signs that there are a pro there is a problem, what do, we, what do we hear about in the doctor's office? So uh, cough is a very common first presenting symptom 
for pulmonary fibrosis or ILD. It's also a, a very common symptom just globally. And so um, persistent cough uh, or chronic cough um, is, is just a really common reason to come into a pulmonologist's office, a very common complaint in the primary care physician's office as well. And when we think about the top five reasons for a person to cough for more than six, one, six months, interstitial lung disease actually doesn't make the top five which is really interesting. So we don't think about that on the top of our brain. We kind of work through our list of other issues that could be driving that and work through um, the evaluation, uh, trying to rule in or out and treat those. Um, if we have done that and ruled those out, then we start to think of less common issues like interstitial lung disease. Similarly, with shortness of breath, there are a myriad of things, including cardiac disease, asthma, COPD or emphysema, things like that that can cause shortness of breath in a patient either acutely or slowly and gradually over time. And so we're, we're taught to think about all the possibilities when we first encounter a person with a new symptom and work through those in a, in a, a systematic way. So when a person comes to my clinic and they have a new symptom, I don't know what they have. I don't assume that they have interstitial lung disease if I don't know otherwise. I have to consider those other things as well. Sometimes patient does not have symptoms and has an abnormal lung exam. They're just there at their doctor's office for another reason, a routine checkup, something like that. And, and the doctor hears something wrong. Well, what could that be? Um, things like congestive heart failure or pneumonia can cause similar sounds in the lungs to pulmonary fibrosis. And so we have to think about those possibilities as well. And we do a lot of imaging on patients, um, particularly those with risk factors for, let's say, lung cancer, like people who are former or current smokers, uh, people who have cardiac imaging looking at the heart uh, with CT. And so we can see when we're looking in an, in an otherwise not symptomatic person, an abnormal x-ray or abnormal CAT scan that um, may show evidence of interstitial lung disease, but there are other things on that list as well that could cause those abnormalities. So when you're, when you're first coming to, you can see how this can get pretty confusing and a little, um, you, can, you could take the wrong off-ramp on that windy road. Now, we wanna hear a, a really thorough and, and really suss out an, a, a thorough clinical history. So when we're hearing these new symptoms, again, we're trying to decide is this, what is this in the first place? What sort of uh, disease process or problem is causing the symptom or abnormal finding? And if it's ILD, what bucket does it go in? Okay, so we talk about symptoms. We wanna know when did they start? How long have they been there? It's getting worse. What makes them better? What makes them worse? Um, are there associated symptoms that go along with that? If we don't have symptoms, I can't tease out any symptoms, how long ago did you have abnormal imaging or an abnormal exam? Has that been going on for a while? Did you know about that before? Um, we also want to know about what context this is arising in the, in, in the patient themselves. So what other medical problems does that person deal with? Do they have a strong uh, history of cardiac disease in, in that person? Are they dealing with other uh, other medical issues that could impact the lungs? Are they dealing with other systemic issues like autoimmune disease or something along those lines? Also, what medications are they taking? Medications can have effects on the lungs and medications that a person is on currently, but as well as medications that have been taken in the past or treatments that have been given like radiation in the past. Um, and so getting to um, uh, what we know about those things is also important. A family history is important, particularly looking for evidence of, of other, other family members with lung conditions, family members with autoimmune disease, family members with, remember, we haven't quite decided if this is pulmonary fibrosis yet, so is there a strong cardiac history in the family and malignancy risk in the family and so on? I would like to know in a pulmonary office, have, have you smoked? Ever smoked? Never smoked? Currently smoking? And how much? If you quit, how long ago? that kind of thing. That's a really important factor in assessing the, st the risk status for some of the things that we deal with in the pulmonary clinic. And then the environment. Our environment really impacts us um, and we don't necessarily think, think about it. So what's going on in the home environment? Um, how old is the house? Is there any water damage? What sorts of pets are there? What other animals that you may not consider pets? 
might be there, those with feathers, if anybody knows what I mean. Um, what sort of work environment are you working? Are you retired? How long has that been? And not just what did you do and where did you work, but what were those job responsibilities and what might have been the, uh, the exposures that were involved in that environment? So again, back to the question, when I'm presented with a new symptom or finding, is it ILD? Is it not? But if it is, what bucket am I gonna put it in? Now there are over 200 different specific interstitial lung disease diagnoses that you can look up in a book or, or somewhere on the internet. Um, but it's easier for me to categorize them in smaller buckets, right? So is it exposure related, something in the environment or some medication or treatment? Is it autoimmune, like something like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, systemic sclerosis, something that affects the immune system that is a systemic problem that affects not just the lungs, but the rest of the body? And is it not one of those things, but it is lung limited and we call it idiopathic, one of the idiopathic interstitial pneumonias? Do I stick it in that bucket for now? And that's part of what that clinical history is trying to get me to is if it is ILD, am I, can I start to think about the evidence that goes in each one of these buckets. This is a tool that was um, put out by the American College of Chest Physicians that some clinics will use and others will use ones that are that are institutional um, and uh, but similar. And, and this is actually multiple pages. These are only two pages, but it's really trying to get at a systematic way of, of trying to um, identify some of those historical factors that Maybe it just is not enough time to get to. I may not think about every exposure that I could possibly ask about, um, but but you may encounter forms like this one uh, or questionnaires, um, and we may go back and revisit that. If we don't know initially that this we're dealing with interstitial lung disease, we might go back and revisit some of these historical features and exposures once we've decided that that, that is what that is. But you might see something like this and you might wonder, oh my goodness, I'm, asking, I'm answering so many questions. I'm filling out all these forms. Are they useful? And yeah, they 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 certainly can be. A physical exam is uh, is important. Um, now, a, a head to toe physical exam is um, is is relevant uh, in the diagnosis of interstitial lung disease. But even when we're starting, we don't know what bucket we're in, right? Um, a lung exam, of course. Obviously, you're hard to get away from having that one if you're in a pulmonologist's office. But the different sounds that happen on a lung exam, is it clear? Are there crackly sounds that sound like Rice Krispies? Are there squeaks and pops um, that, uh, that sound a little different than that? Is there wheezing that sounds more like an airway process, like COPD or active asthma? Are there, is there that snoring sound of ronchi in the lungs? Um, and those might clue us into there um, their being perhaps a different type of physiologic problem depending on what we hear. A heart exam, of course, very important to hear uh, if there is a normal rhythm, a normal rate, are there extra heart sounds besides the lub-dub, lub-dub? Are there murmurs that sound like a whooshing sound that might suggest there's something, something amiss with the valves? Do we hear anything there? In the extremities, remember we talked about systemic problems. Some of those may be uh, evidence of that may be found in the extremities. So there may be swelling of the joints, uh, redness, swelling of the extremities. So gravity dependent swelling, uh, changes in the nails, um, changes in perfusion, um, things like that. So certainly gonna look, look there. Um, uh, muscle strength, muscle mass, is, the, is that normal? Do people, are people having weakness in proximal muscles or, or, or distal muscles or does that seem normal? And on the skin, is there any rash, redness, um, any thickening of the skin or tightening where it shouldn't be, any ulcerations on the fingers, uh, toes, things like that. Um, so just some things that we might be thinking about uh, and looking for if we're thinking about what, what could be the cause of our interstitial lung disease um, and the cause of our symptoms. Now, this is kind of the fifth vital sign in, in a pulmonologist's office is pulmonary function testing. And this is a really, um, helpful tool, a helpful test, a set of tests that people do in the pulmonologist's office with a respiratory lab with a respiratory therapist, if you've not had this before. Um, this is uh, some of the machinery or an example, example of it. And this is a help, helpful in the diagnosis of uh, a respiratory symptom, but it also helps us with an assessment of severity. So if I have a person with cough or shortness of breath, it might help me identify what sort of physiologic process 
is causing me is causing that patient to feel that shortness of breath. Does the air not flow well? Um, is there is there a problem with um, with gas transfer through the lungs and into the bloodstream? Is is there is there a small volume problem? Is there not enough air being able to be moved in and out of the lungs? A restrictive pattern pattern, for example. And this is an example of what you might see with a report of pulmonary function testing. So you have three sections here. We have spirometry. This is where the respiratory therapist says, blow out, blow out, keep blowing, keep blowing. And they make you blow really hard, like your eyeballs are going to pop out of your head. Um, and what they're capturing there is a forced exhalation uh, maneuver where they're catching the volume of how much you can blow out as hard and fast as you can, as well as how much of that comes out of your lungs in the first second. And that is an indication of how well the air flows out of the lungs. Okay, um, if that if those numbers uh, are if the numbers there are low, the the amount you can get out in the first second is low compared to the other volume. Um, that may be an indication of an obstructive lung process like asthma or COPD. If that is a if the uh, the amount of air that goes out in the first second is proportional to what um, what's coming out altogether. Uh, then that maybe indicates another sort of process. In interstitial lung disease and pulmonary fibrosis, what we see is we call a restrictive pattern. So the amount of air that goes out uh, altogether may be low. The volume of the air in the lungs, and this can be measured two ways, either with a box where they close the door and you have to breathe against some resistance, or a nitrogen washout process, and that's some technical differences. They are measuring essentially the same thing in, an, in a pulmonary fibrosis patient. The volume of air is estimate in, in the total lungs. The total lung capacity will be lower than uh, expected in a patient with, uh, with pulmonary fibrosis that's impacting that. And the diffusing capacity, so that's a single breath. It, it allows us to see what the gas transfer is to get through the lungs and into the bloodstream. And um, in ILD, that tends to be uh, lower than expected. And so if you look at this report, you see this PRED column. Those values are the ones that are predicted for this person for their age, height, and gender. And then BEST here is how they performed. And then PERCENT PRED here is the percentage of how they performed compared to what was expected of them. So that's how you kind of look at that. All right, a six minute walk test is something that we often get or ambulatory oximetry. Put a pulse oximeter on the finger and uh, have a walk around the office um, or a walk on a treadmill, depending on uh, the space available in that office. And it helps us not necessarily with a, as a diagnostic test. This may not tell us that we have ILD or which specific type that we're dealing with, but it does help us assess the severity, the functional impact, of the, the physiologic limitations in the lung function. How is that affecting a person's ability to get around in a standard way? Um, how far can they walk? Does their oxygen level go down? Do we need to supply some extra oxygen for certain activities or all the time? And it gives us also a baseline for comparison as we move forward in the future. So it is a benchmark as we start. Now, if you've been through this diagnostic workup, you probably had some lab tests done at some point. Um, some of these may look for autoimmune um, antigens or antibodies, um, looking for uh, these autoimmune diseases that can impact the lungs. So like things like lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, again, that I mentioned. So tests like an anti-nuclear antibody, ANA, or a rheumatoid factor. There's a myriad of tests that can be done. Um, and then sometimes we will look for uh, uh, testing against certain environmental exposures, those that are associated with environmental, uh, environmentally related uh, interstitial lung disease or something called hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Um, so uh, there is generally a limited ability to check those things, um, but, uh, but sometimes that can be useful if we're curious about the impact of those. All right, so that's uh, that's sort of the first bucket of what we're going to talk about here in terms of the clinical evaluation, the things that are going through uh, the the pulmonologist uh, brain as they're collecting that information and making their observations. And then if we're getting to the point where we're thinking about, okay, well, I think I've got an interstitial lung disease here. I, I saw some restrictive physiology. I heard some crackles on the exam. 
then uh, uh, imaging is appropriate. And I would like to now turn it over to Dr. Hobbs to talk with us about uh, the imaging in this scenario and high resolution CT imaging specifically. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so you can go on to the next slide. Thanks. So uh, we've already mentioned that there's a lot of these diffuse lung diseases and interstitial lung diseases. And one of the problems on the clinical side that Dr. Case has talked about a little bit is figuring out which of those might be likely or unlikely. And some of these diseases are fairly rare in the grand scheme. This is also a problem on the imaging side of things. So CT is the primary modality, the primary means from an imaging standpoint that we use to evaluate these diseases. But there's only so many things, so many ways that these diseases can present when you get a scan of your chest, when you get a CAT scan. So there are lots of diseases, only a few ways that they can really present themselves, and we have to tease these things out. And that's one of the things that I really uh, enjoy about these problems is uh, bringing them together, you know, the multidisciplinary aspect that's required uh, to oftentimes uh, diagnose and then treat these patients. So you can move to the next slide. So when we're looking at the radiology specifically, and we'll see a bunch of pictures, my favorite part here in just a moment, um, we're looking at essentially what the findings are on the imaging, right? And that's kind of the overall description. What do the images show? But then trying to pull that together uh, into an imaging pattern that can let us have an order differential, essentially what does the imaging look like from a disease standpoint? So there's one thing for me to say, oh, there's a nodule, but what's the cause of that nodule? What's the likelihood that it's uh, a benign infection or something that might be more serious like a cancer? And then obviously also there's an entire integration that needs to occur what does the imaging mean for you as an individual patient, right? In the clinical context of what's going on with you, uh, what's happening with cough or your you know, difficulty uh, walking or any other your clinical symptoms, what's happening? How does that imaging play a part in your uh, diagnosis? And what's that doing over time? So one of the big things for us, you can move to the next slide again, is getting a good quality HRCT, a high resolution CT. And if you have a scan like this, it's very difficult to tell, is there something wrong in the lungs or not? There's a lot of motion here, and this can be a challenge for a lot of patients if we're asking them to come in and get a scan and they uh, have difficulty holding their breath because you have a disease that's affecting your lungs. Uh, it can be hard sometimes, but it is important. So you can move to the next slide as well. So that technique and how we acquire these images helps us a lot, especially with these diffuse lung diseases. They need to be relatively thin section and how you breathe matters. So if you were to come in and get a CAT scan of your lungs, we're probably gonna ask you to take a full inspiration, take a deep breath and hold it, and then let us take all of our pictures. We'll also, probably have you breathe all the way out and hold that and then take more pictures because that gives us additional imaging, uh, additional information as well. And we also may need to have you lay on your belly and redo that imaging as well because that gives us additional imaging as well. And each parts of that uh, imaging sequence helps answer specific questions uh, that helps guide what we think may be going on on the CAT scan. So next slide. So this is an example of a very normal high resolution CT. You can see the difference between a relatively thick section here and a thin section. So a normal CT, uh, instead of a high resolution one, the three millimeter here on the left uh, shows the pulmonary vessels very well. I can see the rest of the lungs, but I can't really see the interstitium very well. I can't see these very, very tiny little structures that run through your lungs. And you can see on the thin millimeter sections here to the left, I can see all these tiny little aspects in the lungs that are harder to see on that three millimeter section. So if I don't do this, 
then it's harder to make uh, some of those diagnoses uh, that we're talking about today, but certainly not needed necessarily for all of those run-of-the-mill uh, diagnoses. But for the diffuse lung disease cases, for the interstitial lung disease cases, this is important. Move to the next slide. Another thing that we'll ask you to do is that breathing in and breathing out. So here, this CAT scan looks very different than the one that we just presented. All of the lungs should look relatively dark, and there's all this, uh, we call it opacity, all this gray inside the lung that should normally be aerated. And so the question is, is this normal or is there something going on here? You can click next. And here, higher up in the lungs, this is a slightly higher level, the dark uh, in the middle here is actually your trachea, that's your airway. And we can see from that the way it's shaped in this, that you're actually breathing out when this CAT scan was taken. So we can tell from this, you can move to the next slide, that if you're breathing out, it makes a big difference in how your lungs look. So this is the same patient, the one on the left is them taking a breath and all the way out. So taking a deep breath in and then blowing it all the way out, and that's what your lungs look like in a normal patient. And then if you take a deep breath in and hold it, that's what it looks like on the right. So that's why following those breathing instructions matters a lot for our ability to uh, tell you what's actually going on on the imaging. So next slide. So we look specifically on those expiratory CTs to see what we uh, refer to as air trapping. Now, uh, you can see a few examples where these areas of darkness and these small little rounded areas of darkness show up. Everybody has some mild degree of air trapping here, but if it's a very common feature on your particular scan, then that uh, makes it much easier to uh, uh, diagnose certain conditions that have more of this. And that's why we're asking you to breathe out to see. Next slide. And then here is another example. In the dependent lungs down here, again, it should look all dark. All of that dark area uh, here on the scan should look the same. But more posteriorly towards the lower end of the image, you can see some ground glass opacities, a, a terminology we use for some of that gray area. The lungs don't look all the same. We want to know, is that an interstitial lung disease or is it normal? So you can click the next slide. And here we see if we put somebody prone and lay them on their belly, all of that goes away because the lung really is made up of a lot of air and your the weight of your body will push your lung down and actually make it look different than if it was uh, uh, fully inflated. So this technique we use to answer some of those questions. And that's why we'll probably ask you to lay on your belly if you can, uh, especially for some of these diffuse lung diseases. So you can move to the next one. So this is an example of a good quality HRCT that has a diffuse lung disease. From the images that we acquired, I can see how it's distributed in the lungs. I can see uh, all the findings necessary uh, to do that because I've had that high quality uh, HRCT uh, that lets me find all those features that I need. The patient here did a really great job holding their breath and following all those breathing instructions. So next slide. So when we're looking at these, lucky for me, uh, we've made a lot of progress, uh, especially over the last 10 to 15 years, in categorizing these diffuse lung diseases on imaging. And there are several uh, guideline papers that we use uh, to help uh, put these cases into buckets, essentially. Uh, and those buckets correspond with the likelihood uh, of you having certain uh, a certain disease. A lot of it is uh, around idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, um, but then some other disease processes are in there as well. So next slide. So all of these guideline papers uh, correlate under these four different uh, disease categories. That is what we refer to as a definite UIP pattern, a probable pattern, an indeterminate pattern, or an alternative diagnosis type pattern. So UIP here stands for usual interstitial pneumonia. Uh, 
and that's basically an imaging or a pathologic diagnosis, right? It's not your underlying disease process, um, but it's what we would see if we were to biopsy these patients or what we can see uh, on imaging. So the point here is not to uh, you know, understand exactly what all of these uh, uh, terms mean, but if you're reading your imaging report, realize that these are the types of words that are gonna show up on those reports and these are the types of categories we're going to be trying to put your case into probably to guide therapy and uh, see what the diagnosis may be. So we can go through and show some different examples of these too. So next slide. So here is what we refer to as a definite UIP pattern. This means that if you were to biopsy these, this patient, uh, do an actual open lung biopsy, uh, chances are that pathology would show a UIP pattern. And in the right clinical context, that means that it's probably going to turn out to be idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. And that helps us guide that therapy. Again, a high quality HRCT here lets me understand the distribution of these findings, how it is in the lungs, and find all those key words that I need uh, to be able to say, yes, this looks uh, like a classic case of this disease process. And one thing I wanna point out here is in the peripheral lower lungs, like on the last image to the right, and down at the bottom, there is honeycombing. And you'll see that very frequently described in the very peripheral aspect of your lung, these reticular markings that form small little cystic spaces, small little rounded lucencies uh, in the peripheral part of the lung. You'll see that talked about a lot. And you have to see that to have this high confidence diagnosis of this UIP pattern. Next slide. So if everything was that easy, I wouldn't have a job. But it turns out it can be hard to even identify whether or not honeycombing gets seen or not. And that's supposedly a, a big part uh, of prognosis for uh, you as a patient uh, and for diagnosing uh, you as a patient. Because there's a lot of overlap, like I said, in some of these imaging findings. So we as radiologists don't always agree on honeycombing. So that begged the question, how do we handle those cases where we're not sure? Next slide. And lucky for us, people have done a lot of work over this over the last uh, few years and really discovered that if you have all of those same features, that same pattern of disease in the definite UIP pattern, but you just don't have honeycombing, then you still have a high likelihood of having a UIP pattern if you were to biopsy those patients. So that helps us as imagers out a lot because it takes a little bit of that stress out of having to determine accurately whether or not there's honeycombing or not, but we still talk about it a lot. Still, there are challenges. This was a paper uh, that I like uh, because it essentially uh, mimics real life. It took a bunch of patients who had interstitial lung diseases from a variety of causes and just asked some expert thoracic radiologists, what do you think it is and how confident are you that that's what it is? So you can move to the next question, next uh, slide. And what they found was uh, cases like this, where these cases for me as an imager don't look anything like the cases that I just showed. These look like different disease processes. Here, uh, the one on the left looks like what we call non-specific interstitial pneumonia, which is different than that usual interstitial pneumonia case that I was just showing. And on the other one, it looks much more like sarcoid. Another one hedged his bets and added some other disease processes in there as well. But these were biopsied, next to uh, click again, and they were all uh, UIP pattern. So these cases in the end actually turned out to be IPF, despite the fact that they don't look like classic IPF. And that's one of the reasons, again, the imaging of these patients uh, and diagnosis uh, of you can be challenging sometimes. So next slide. So that brings us to an indeterminate pattern. So these are cases where we can't tell as imagers uh, and the likelihood that you were to have UIP or you know, IPF uh, is much lower. 
right? A lot of these will require biopsy for uh, a final diagnosis, uh, or certainly like a multidisciplinary discussion where uh, I, as an imager, I'm talking with uh, the pathologists and the pulmonologists, et cetera. And then there are other disease cases that just flat out look like other diseases. They look like sarcoid, they look like uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, or any of these other diffuse lung diseases. Examples here, a classic case of NSIP, another diffuse lung disease, or even organizing pneumonia. Again, these look different than the others. Next slide. So, one of the other key roles of getting a CT is not just diagnosing you to begin with, but evaluating whether or not there's been progression of your disease. And that can manifest in lots of different ways, and I've listed out here a bunch of the different imaging findings that might indicate fibrosis. But one of the key things uh, that you might undergo after your initial CT that establishes a diagnosis is a follow-up CT uh, that might determine uh, has your fibrosis, at least from an imaging perspective, uh, gotten worse or not. And that's one of the key uh, things that we look at for imaging. Next. And then also there's a concept of acute exacerbation. So these, uh, from a clinical standpoint, are often uh, a worsening of your symptoms. You might uh, seem like you've got the flu or you know a viral uh, you know type symptoms on top of your uh, normal uh, cough, and it's you might even end up in the hospital. And we can evaluate these cases. Uh, and again, look for progression of your disease and look for uh, abnormalities that are superimposed kind of on your baseline level of fibrosis or your baseline diffuse lung disease. Next slide. And the pattern of these acute things can even uh, give an indication of how likely you are to have for progression of your fibrosis. Again, so all things that imaging can help answer as far as these questions go. Next slide. So that's a lot to take in, and a lot of that uh, is, uh, you know, a, a lot to see with all those pictures, but kind of gives you a little bit of a spectrum of why uh, your uh, pulmonologist or your primary care provider may be interested in ordering a CT, uh, or maybe even be interested in ordering a follow-up CT, right? Combining that CT information helps limit their differential diagnosis, uh, especially if you have a relatively non-specific uh, clinical presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you so much for that. Uh, it is a lot of information. I think it is super helpful in trying to understand how important the imaging is in this process. And that's kind of what we're talking about today, right? Is the process of getting to a diagnosis. So, um, so we talked a lot about the clinical findings, what, uh, what the pulmonologist is trying to assess and observe uh, and bring as evidence to the table, um, the radiographic features that help us uh, either narrow down or um, make, it, make a final diagnosis. Um, so now we're at the point where we can once again ask the question, is this new finding or symptom interstitial lung disease? Um, and hopefully at this point, we can answer that question with a yes or a no and move on to that. And the answer there is yes. Remember our buckets. Can we narrow down the bucket? And a lot of that is clinical information, but there may be some clues as you saw in the imaging that help us, uh, help us decide that. Can we now make a confident diagnosis? And by that, I mean, if you as a person, a patient who's coming in with, uh, with a symptom or a new finding is a thousand piece puzzle and your symptom is the first 10 pieces of that, then have I filled in enough of those thousand pieces to confidently say what the picture is, right? I may not have a thousand pieces. I may be missing a lot of pieces, but are they pieces on the, on the periphery that that I can really see the picture and tell what I'm looking at? Or is there a big hole in the middle of my evidence there and I still don't have enough information to know what I'm, know what I'm dealing with and make a plan, okay? And so if you think about it that way, each of the, um, the clinician uh, 
and the radiologist brings pieces of evidence, puzzle pieces to the table and tries to put them down. So what other piece of, ev piece of evidence might we need? Well, in the clinical evaluation, perhaps we've uncovered some things that suggest that this patient who doesn't have a known rheumatologic problem may have one. Maybe there seems to be evidence that there's a systemic process going on that could be related to the lung process. And interstitial lung disease is commonly related to systemic autoimmune conditions. And so I might call in, uh, phone a friend in the rheumatology department. Uh, a rheumatologist is a doctor who specializes in musculoskeletal disorders and those that are autoimmune and systemic. So they're dealing with the connective tissues, the muscles, the bones, the ligaments, the tendons, the skin, the things that hold us together. And they might offer and bring puzzle pieces that are a little bit more focused uh, history and physical exam findings. They might um, have experience looking at joints and, and, and skin that I, I don't have as a pulmonologist that they can bring that information to the table with those puzzle pieces. And they may offer some additional immune system laboratory testing, blood tests um, that, uh, that can help give us some evidence. Uh, and they may, they may get um, some specialized x-rays, not necessarily of the lungs, but maybe of the, of the joints, the hands, the feet, um, something like that. So they may offer um, some different types of, uh, of tests and again, puzzle pieces and evidence. Um, Dr. Hobbs also mentioned that um, sometimes on our high resolution CT imaging that can predict what we will see on a biopsy if we were to do it. And so we may be able to avoid a biopsy if there's a confident finding um, of a specific type of lung injury on the CAT scan. But sometimes, as you can see, maybe those findings are not uh, specific to something, don't tell us what the pathology would look like. And so we may need to know that if there's not enough clinical puzzle pieces, if there's not enough radiographic puzzle pieces to tell what we need, we might need some biopsy evidence. And we can get those lung biopsy pieces a couple of different ways in interstitial lung disease. The most common ways to do that are bronchoscopy. And so that is a, a fiber optic camera scope that goes down into the lungs. Hopefully you're not wide awake as grandma is here, but um, done usually by a pulmonologist, sometimes a surgeon or a surgical procedure where somebody um, makes surgical incisions uh, through the outside of the chest wall and gets surgical biopsy um, specimens that way. So um, that information then, those, those pieces of information are handed to a pathologist. They, they process that information, they look at it under the microscope and tell us more about the pattern of lung injury, just like we were seeing in, uh, in the radiology uh, puzzle pieces, tells us about the pattern of lung injury that's seen under the microscope. And this can be very helpful if we've got missing pieces um, in the middle of our puzzle. It can be helpful in getting to a final diagnosis. Although I will warn you, it is not always conclusive. There can be features on a biopsy that can represent multiple different types of lung injuries. And so we may not have narrowed things down completely by doing so. That is a risk um, in, in getting biopsies. So they're not always conclusive, but generally they are quite helpful. And so Dr. Hobbs also mentioned a multi multidisciplinary team. And this is where I like to say that we bring all our puzzle pieces to the table and we try to put them together and see what kind of picture we can make and see if we have a consensus about what it's supposed to look like, what we think it is, and how confident we are in knowing what that picture is, what that diagnosis is, and if there is, again, any other information we may need to go back and review, ask about, evaluate, and look for that might be missing puzzle pieces that we can, we can figure out. Now, I have patients come to the office and say, my goodness, I've had so much tests. I've had all the tests that could possibly be done. There can't be more tests to be done, right? Well, we do more tests uh, as we move forward. Even after making a diagnosis, there may be other things that need to be evaluated, particularly as you're moving forward to assess for progress and progression uh, moving forward? Is the disease getting worse over time? Is it staying stable? Uh, what is the impact of the treatment that we're having? Um, and so pulmonary function testing, remember we had a baseline, over time can help us assess response to therapy, progression of disease, 
and so on. And so those very helpful repeating uh, uh, walk tests and tests of oxygenation, and sometimes repeating those images can be helpful in assessing, again, response and, and progression. So we, we do see those again over time, they come back and it's not just a one and done usually. Like, and also, you know, there are other conditions comorbidities, we call them, that are frequently associated with interstitial lung disease. I'm just giving you a couple here, and that's gastroesophageal reflux, pulmonary hypertension, or sleep apnea that might require additional testing that uh, to try and diagnose those and manage them appropriately. And so there may be additional imaging tests, a sleep study if that's appropriate, seeing other uh, other consultants to help manage those problems if they're um, if they're present, and uh, and and the pulmonologist needs assistance with those. And then for those patients who go forward with lung transplant evaluation, I mean that's a that's a a lot of testing that goes on to make sure that that patient is an appropriate candidate for transplant and uh, and and understand how safely to move forward if that's the way to go. So uh, so there may be additional evaluations that that are appropriate and need to be done in the future. So just to wrap this up, I do wanna have um, some time. We've got some great questions coming in and if there, uh, if there are others, please drop those in the question box. But just to summarize, you know, we really focused in, in uh, the area of ILD in timely and accurate diagnosis. And there are certainly challenges to those, um, but, but really top of mind is determining if this, if the problem is interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis, and if it is trying to get the most accurate specific diagnosis possible to, to treat the patient in the best way possible as well. And then the multidisciplinary evaluation. You see, uh, as a pulmonologist, I can't do this all on my own. The radiologist is, is very important in interpreting those pieces of the puzzle and helping us understand and, and, and fill in the gaps in, in that diagnosis. And sometimes we also need our surgical colleagues, uh, pathologists, other specialties like rheumatology to help, uh, to help really put that complex picture together. So um, I am going to ask Dr. Hobbs to, to flip back on for us here. And we've got some great questions coming in. Um, I will, I'm just gonna flip through some of these so y'all bear with me. Um, this is actually a great question for you, um, Stephen. This is how much radiation is a patient exposed to with a high resolution CT scan? Um, so uh, the answer depends on how many times we actually scan your chest. Um, so e you get radiation essentially each time uh, we ask you to take a breath and hold it, uh, or if we ask you to uh, lay on your belly and then re-scan, that would be more radiation as well. Uh, that being said, most uh, modern day scanners, which are in use pretty much everywhere at this point, um, have really done a great job of reducing the amount of radiation. Um, and honestly, uh, it should not really be a primary concern, right? If you need to have the scan of your chest uh, to answer these questions, um, then I would not let the worry of that radiation uh, be a factor in that decision. Uh, most scans now take that into a, a account. Uh, we do the imaging that we need to to answer those questions, and the scanners themselves have a lot of built-in mechanisms to minimize that amount of radiation. That's great, thank you. Um, so I will take this one. Um, a question, when a doctor hears crackles in the lungs during a physical exam, is that a pretty good indication that pulmonary fibrosis is present? Um, I do think that that, uh, that sound is one that narrows your sort of list of possibilities, um, but it doesn't narrow it to one, to just pulmonary fibrosis. Um, uh, congestive heart failure with, uh, with pulmonary edema or fluid in the lung tissue can cause a very similar type sound in the lungs. Um, and, 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 you know, unfortunately, congestive heart failure is a very common problem that that um, people have. Um, so, so that's another thing that goes on my list. Um, depending on the clinical situation, certain types of infections, acute bacterial pneumonia, can cause a crackly sound in the lungs, um, and other types of, uh, so let's say, um, fluid in the lungs, pulmonary edema, that maybe not 
uh, related to, con to congestive heart failure in the acutely ill patient, for example, can also cause um, crackles. This is a short list of things that I'm thinking about when I hear that, but, um, but certainly um, crackles on a lung exam, or when we say crackles, that sound to me sounds like if you got long hair like I do, you can take your hair and like rub it right next to your ear. I think it sounds a little bit like that, but also like if you put um, your ear over a bowl of Rice Krispies and, and um, milk, it makes kind of that sound. It's truly a crackly sound. When you hear that in inspiration, uh, it, you know, pulmonary fibrosis or interstitial lung disease of some kind goes up high, much higher on my list. And I want to think about that while I'm thinking about um, kind of all the other, all the other possibilities. Um, I, Dr. Hobbs, I'm going to get your help with this question. Um, is because uh, this is something you talked quite a bit about. Is is all UIP or usual interstitial pneumonia IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis? Yeah, uh, that would be nice, <laughs> but but it is not right. Um, and so I think uh, we as imagers uh, identify that pattern which pathologists do as well, uh, but even that pattern overlaps with other disease processes. Um, and so you can have a clinical diagnosis uh, of absolutely something that's not idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, um, uh, even if you have a UIP pattern on your imaging. Um, so it can absolutely be seen uh, in other disease processes uh, connective tissue disease related ILD, for example, is not an uncommon one. Uh, sometimes uh, reactions to uh, uh, medications, drug toxicity uh, can cause that type of a pattern. And inhalational injuries like hypersensitivity pneumonitis can also present with that pattern sometimes too. Um, so rarely uh, is, you know, am I as a radiologist uh, being that definitive. Uh, and I don't generally diagnose in that sense idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. I diagnose the pattern of disease and then it's up to uh, our clinical colleagues and us in a multidisciplinary fashion to bring all of that together with all of the other, you know, clinical context and laboratory testing and PFTs and all the rest of it uh, to come to a final diagnosis a lot of times. Yeah, that's a great answer and I think that is really an important thing to remember is that when you, um, that that evidence of the type and pattern of lung injury is is a, is a handful of puzzle pieces and can be very helpful um, once you set it in the middle of your clinical context. And so it's not, um, it's not as though all, all of this finding equals that. You really have to put it in the context because a UIP finding in one person could be a, an IPF diagnosis, but a UIP finding in another person could be something completely different, like an autoimmune disease, as you mentioned. Um, I have a question here. Um, let me see. Are there, oh, are there more autoimmune diseases? I kept saying the same same ones over and over again, and I'm sorry about that, but uh, I did not get a bit, give an exhaustive list. So only two autoimmune diseases that can affect the lungs. Uh, no, <laughs> there are, there are many. And um, on our, on our kind of top of mind short list, and I'm probably going to miss some here, so don't quote me, but uh, I always say rheumatoid arthritis and and uh, systemic sclerosis and lupus and uh, in Sjogren's syndrome and um, and uh, mixed connective tissue disease and some of the myositis uh, inflammatory myopathy so polymyositis dermatomyositis there are patients who have sort of a, a smattering of findings that don't necessarily fit into one diagnostic box and so that can still um, still be an autoimmune origin to the lung disease. So no, it's not just it's not just the ones I kept mentioning because I I was going back to that as, as I was talking about other things. But um, there are there are several, and this is why uh, you know a rheumatologist can be very helpful in in assessing you know whether there are things that I might miss when I'm really focused here to here um, that that they might see or or pick up on or interpret differently um, than than I would. Um, okay, I have uh, had another question for you, uh, Dr. Hobbs, and that, let me find it. Oh, this is a great one, actually. So um, can you do a cardiac CT scan at the same time as a lung CT? Um, so yes-ish. <laughs> so uh, could you get them done in the same sitting? Uh, yes. 
Uh, but when we do the cardiac uh, specific CT, uh, that's going to be geared specifically to answering a different set of clinical questions, right? So if you just got the cardiac CT, that's probably not going to be kind of the complete HRCT evaluation uh, that we would need to answer like all those questions that I'd, uh, you know, kind of listed out and everything as well. Um, but that being said, you could get it done at the, the same time. Um, and, you know, at our institution, for example, uh, that sometimes happens with uh, like lung transplant evaluations who under, undergo like a cardiac evaluation will get a cardiac CT at the same time as a regular, you know, chest CT to evaluate their more diffuse lung too. Uh, the other thing about a cardiac CT is that your heart only occupies a relatively small portion of your chest. Uh, and because we're trying to minimize radiation, if all we do is scan your heart, then we haven't scanned all the rest of your lungs. Uh, and if we're doing an HRCT, then we really want to see the entirety of your lungs. Uh, but that being said, you can uh, do them potentially simultaneously, but they'll be, you know, technically uh, different scans when, when that occurs. That's very helpful. It is when you start to think about or in, in my case, order CAT scans of things, you you can be quickly overwhelmed by the number of different ways there are to um, to image the chest. And so I think some of these clarifications are, are really helpful um, to hear. So thank you for that. Um, I, I love this question um, and I mentioned it just really briefly in passing, but that was a nail change, a change in the, in the um, in the fingernails, for example, linked to interstitial lung disease. And I always like to tell my patients, I like to look at people's hands. It was told by uh, uh, an attending when I was in training, looking at hands was, was uh, you could tell a lot potentially by looking at people's hands. And, uh, and in my line of work, that is true. Um, I'm not as good as uh, say a rheumatologist at some of those findings, but um, specifically, if you're looking at the nails in patients with chronic lung disease, particularly chronic hypoxemic lung disease or interstitial lung disease can happen in others as well, but you can get a, a different shape to the fingernails. Um, we call it clubbing or digital clubbing. And it, um, it, if you look up a picture of it, you can see like, um, you'll, you could Google some very uh, dramatic pictures, but um, it's just a different shape of the way that the nail uh, hits into the into the nail bed, and so um, once you've seen that a few times, you start to recognize it, even if it's early, and that may be a clue um, that uh, that there could be an interstitial lung disease, some point of fibrosis going on. It's not a hundred percent. Some people have uh, nails that are shaped that way naturally, and there are other things that can cause it, but. Um, but that is something that I look at. Other things in the hands, uh, you know, joint swellings, particularly in the small joints of the hands, uh, redness, um, pain on uh, when you when you kind of palpate or feel, uh, uh, chronic deformities of the fingers uh, and joints, um, uh, cold or or um, pale pallor in the hands, things like that. Um, so so lots of things to to be able to look at and tell. But that's kind of a nail change. And in the rheumatologist office, they might actually uh, look for um, for uh, capillary changes, so tiny blood vessel changes underneath the nails. They have a way of doing that. Some of them do uh, in their office. They kind of they call it nail fold capillaroscopy, and they kind of look and see if there are any nail changes that could be indicative of of certain types of um, of uh, auto systemic autoimmune disease. So, um, so lots you can tell. It's kind of surprising um, that that can happen. Um, Thank you so much for all of your wonderful questions. I am actually going to have to, uh, we are running up against time, uh, and I'm going to have to um, uh, leave it here. We will try to follow up with those of you who have additional questions uh, via email if you've left them there. So thank you for your engagement. Uh, thank you for being here today. Thank you to Dr. Stephen Hobbs for your wonderful out, uh, overview of um, of uh, the high resolution CT and the imaging findings as we evaluate uh, patients with interstitial lung disease. I would also like to um, thank our sponsors for today. You see them here. Um, I remind you, we will have, this is a webinar series. We will have more offerings throughout the year um, and uh, have you on the lookout for um, different announcements that will come from the foundation about the PFF Summit later this year. Um, and uh, other events that you can get involved with. Um, if you would, if you're still listening and you would uh, be able to stay on after the end of our, um, of our webinar today, we will offer an opportunity for some feedback 
um, immediately thereafter, and this will help us um, gauge how we're doing, how we're meeting your needs, and if there are other ideas for webinars moving forward. We really appreciate your feedback, and again, thank you for being here today, um, and uh, thank you again to Dr. Hobbs. You guys have a wonderful day, and we'll see you next time.